Lou, I wanted to ask you a question about, uh, generally speaking about New Jersey real estate uh, closing procedures. Everybody's sitting around the table, and the attorneys of their all experience, they know what to do with this mountain of paper that's in front of them and what goes where. And it usually winds up being a very happy day for all the people that are involved. Uh, but it seems to me that a lot of the work that you do to get to that point is really the major function of having an attorney for a real estate transaction um, in New Jersey. Would you agree with that? I think so. The actual closing itself really just completes all the hard work that's gone in before that date sitting around the closing table. Now, you've represented buyers and sellers, is that right? Oh, sure. Which one has more work associated with it? Buyers do because not only are you starting off with the contract, going through the process of um, doing a deed for a seller, you've got all the in-between work in terms of the uh, dealing with the mortgage company if there are any questions or problems, dealing with the title company to make sure everything's ready to go. Typically, what, at what point do you get involved with the seller? In other words, at what point does the seller come to you to, to represent him on the, on the, on the process? More often than not, it's really once a contract is actually signed. Um, in a perfect world, almost, you'd want to see the seller with the contract unsigned because once the contract is signed, you immediately go into a three-day attorney review right. process. So what you really want to do is get the contract as soon as possible, and if it's going to be signed by the time you get it, uh, be able to get to it and speak to the people about it as quickly as possible. But typically, in the, when you're representing the seller, you won't have had a chance to see the contract ahead of time? In other words, it's something that the realtor and the seller or the seller on his own will have uh, put together? Yeah. If the seller has a realtor, uh, uh, normally what would occur is you'd be presented with a signed contract. There are many times, though, where sellers will determine to proceed uh, to sell their properties without a realtor, and they would actually come to you as the attorney to prepare the contract for them. So the sellers are not normally preparing the contract on their own? No. It's either done by the realtor or by the attorney ahead of time? Correct. Now, can you talk to me about this three-day attorney review? Because I always think about that from the perspective of the buyer. Does the seller also have a chance to that three days to withdraw from the contract? Correct. Uh, both sides have that time. It's set in the contract that there is this 72-hour window for the parties to review it. And it's an extremely important time for both sides, not just the buyers. Um, many times people, I think, believe that the buyers have the um, most important um, or many of the most important questions at that point, and maybe they do because many times you get novice buyers, first-time buyers. But in terms of looking at the contract, even from the seller's perspective, if you're representing a seller, you want to make sure that what is happening is what the seller is actually agreeing to. There's either nothing been placed in the contract or there's nothing going to be added to the contract that would harm the seller. Now, what's supposed to happen during the 72 hours? In other words, it's a 72 hours presumably for attorney review, but a lot of these transactions take place over the weekend and it might be a holiday weekend, you know, so uh, you might not be able to get to an attorney until the 72 hours is over. What's, uh, how does this all work? Is it actually 72 hours or does it ex extend it? Well, the 72 hours <clears throat> is the statutory time. By agreement between the parties through their attorneys, you can extend that period for any length of time necessary. Many times, as you said, weekends occur holiday times, maybe attorneys are just very busy in court and with other things they're doing and they just simply haven't had the time to sit down with their clients and discuss the matter fully or maybe collect the amount of information they need to properly decide what changes might need to be made to the contract. Is this something that's, that's pretty strictly enforced or it's kind of relaxed among, among the parties in terms of backing out of the 72 hours? No, it's a very formal process and has to be done correctly. If it's not done correctly, person can be locked into the contract as a result. All right. Well, let's go back to me as seller. Let's say I, I have a, a property that I want to sell. Uh, let's assume for the sake of argument that I'm married, that there's a small mortgage on the property, all right? And I have a realtor that I've uh, engaged to sell the property for me. The realtor has found a, a buyer. The buyer and I have agreed upon a price. We have both signed the contract. I, I'm bringing you a copy of the contract right now. What's your procedure? What would you do at this point with me as a client? As a seller, what I'm concerned about is uh, making sure first that you just understand generally the contract, what you're selling, how much you're selling it for, what are the conditions in terms of any deposits being made by the buyer, uh, what monies can be expected and how they can be expected at closing. But most of the contracts contain standard language that many times will say that a seller agrees to make repairs any correct any violations no matter how much money it is and obviously what you're doing as an attorney for the sellers you want to make sure that that seller 
either understands that or will put some limit or a cap on the type of repairs necessary. You don't want them to go into a transaction and have the buyer's attorney come back and say, there is now $10,000 worth of repairs that must be taken care of and have the contract say that your client is required to make all those repairs. Let's talk about some specifics, though, okay? Um, let's talk about money. Everybody's always interested in money. My experience has been lots of times when the uh, buyer and the seller kind of get together informally over the weekend, they may exchange a small amount of money initially upon the signing of the contract, maybe like $1,000, okay? What happens to that money? Well, usually there's some good faith deposit that's... That's what I mean. Uh, either desired or wanted by uh, the seller to kind of um, give them some certainty that the buyer is going to continue on with it. Normally, that money is paid by way of just a personal check and uh, usually uh, held. Uh, earnest money. Yes. And just held by the realtor uh, in their trust account uh, until the time of closing. Now, supposing that a realtor is not involved with, with this, so what happens then? Certainly, the money can be deposited in either attorney's trust account. Um, and generally, the attorneys will agree who is going to hold that money. But from, you as, uh, from your perspective, if the seller came to you with the check, assuming that the, the realtor has taken it already, you would take possession of it and put it in your attorney trust account? That is correct. All right. Now, the next thing is normally these, these agreements call for the payment of some fairly substantial amount of money at some point. You know, I guess that deals with the mortgage. So can you explain to me how that works? Mm -hmm. Well, many times there is actually even maybe a second deposit, and usually that goes to the idea of what the mortgage company is going to require in terms of a deposit um, for the mortgage to be con considered by the mortgage company. So it's possible not only there might be this earnest money, $1,000 initially, but there could even be uh, an agreement that upon um, acceptance of the contract by all parties that another four thousand five thousand ten thousand dollars would be deposited it could be deposited again with the uh, realtor or possibly one of the attorneys okay so let's take a much more conservative approach let's say that the agreement contemplated that there'd be an additional twenty percent of the purchase price paid down within ten days after the parties agree on the contract would that be reasonable sure and again the money would be held either by the realtors or, or one of the realtors. I get the realtor for the seller, I would imagine, right? Yes, usually. Or by the by you as the attorney for the seller? Usually, yes. Okay. You would place that in your attorney trust account? Correct. All right. Now, so do you ever take in a, into consideration that you say that you criticize the contract because you think your, your client had a bad deal? In other words, he sold the property for more than it was worth or less than it was worth, things of that nature? I usually won't get involved in that since I don't think I have an expertise to know what a property is valued at what its fair market value is. I think the uh, client either has to rely, if they're not using a realtor, on what they anticipate that they want as a, as a sale price or rely on their realtor to tell them what they think a property should properly appraise at. 